everyone. Welcome to week nine. And it is an attempt in many ways to bring so many of the different themes together that we've been addressing so far in the course. So this week are kind of an opportunity to reflect on the different ways in which um, many of the thinkers that we've considered from Descartes to Freud to Marx, etc., have a return again. So I just want to comment just very quickly on the image that I have um, chosen. It is, of course, an image of a cat. And as an image of the cat, for those of you who've read Derrida's piece, you'll see that the cat motif is quite significant uh, for him in that essay. And also, I'm very conscious of not wanting to set things up where somehow at the end of the course I say, okay, everyone, it's all been brought together. And someone like Griffin will say, ah, Melanie, you set me up. In fact, there are dangling questions. There are things outstanding. I can only but do my best. The image today, um, tell me what you see. I mean, it's obviously a cat. And the title of the image is optical illusion, cat dance. And can you tell me why, um, if you see the optical illusion, basically? You don't see the, does anyone see the optical illusion? Yes. Exactly. It's moving. Whoops, I'll have to do it over here. It's moving like this, like you don't really quite know what, what are the forefront of the paws or what are the back back of the paw. So it could be looking this way, and it can be moving that way. You may not be entirely convinced. That's fine. Um, uh, When I post the slides online, you can look, and it requires a little bit of an adjustment, a mental adjustment to sort of see it. So this paw is the front one, and then it moves, moves that way. In any event, the purpose of this image, assuming we had actually seen the illusion, is to introduce one of the themes that we'll be considering with respect to Derrida. And one of the qualities of Derrida's writing, many, many people find his writing extraordinarily frustrating. And if you found it extraordinarily frustrating, did anyone? Yes, oh, feel, feel the hand, you know, many people agree with you. And what I'll try to do today in the lecture is to explain a bit the method behind the madness um, and to identify one of the uh, central themes of the nature of his work, which is a real effort at conditioning something to be undecidable. So the principle behind this illusion is that once you have an awareness of the fact that there is an illusion and you get a glimpse of another reality or another possible way of seeing this cat here dancing, it becomes then uncertain as to whether the cat is facing this way or that way, putting its paw here or there. And if you were to have to decide which one is it, Now, with this vantage and this knowledge, you would have to sort of pull back and say, well, I can't decide. It's both, depending on whatever vantage or whatever perspective uh, is on offer. So that gives sort of uh, of ever so much the vaguest introduction to thinking about what somebody like Derrida is wanting to accomplish. That said... I've got just a couple of reminders and announcements before we get underway. The first is that the My Experience uh, surveys are available, and they're very easy for you to complete. Um, If you go on to Moodle, you'll see the uh, very attractive, uh, very UNSW stylized My Experience link. You can't miss it. So you can go into my experience and just have one survey per course. Wow. I know. 
So I'm trying to build up enthusiasm for this. This is really one of the only centralized ways, formalized ways, I should say, where ex your experience in the course, if you appreciated the course, if you've got uh, suggestions or ideas about how to improve the course, uh, this is the means by which um, uh, it's the formal way to do it, of course. Um, informal uh, chats or emails are always lovely as well, whether you have things to improve or uh, um, appreciation. But please, this is really the number one way uh, that all of us who are uh, part of your teaching staff across the board can actually collect feedback and the feedback that the university actually takes seriously. So. So far, I've been introducing a number of themes, and you know, I think each week we've been adding another uh, ball to the juggling, and we've been keeping them going. Some uh, we come back to, some we miss a week, etc. And so far, these are the themes that I want us to be attentive to in our consideration of Derrida today. And there are a number of different themes that have the characteristic of some kind of opposition, some kind of duality that organizes and structures them. In many ways, this might be a characteristic of and a characteristic of and a legacy of that Cartesian um, uh, dualism uh, between mind and body. We see this dualism manifesting across these four different areas. And of course, we could presumably pull out many other different themes. But we've introduced, first of all, the distinction between the moral and the immoral. And so we can return to Durkheim. We can think about Freud's response to Durkheim. We could introduce the work of DeWall. And think about, in each of those thinkers' different ways, they have been contributing to theorizing and thinking about the role of morality. That is to say, the role of morality as a, as a constitutive dimension of human selfhood. To what extent is it? a fundamentally exceptional attribute of human beings? To what extent can it be extended to non-human animals? And to what extent does this uh, notion of morality and the corresponding, the corresponding uh, distinction that it introduces between good and bad how, does it con how is it conditioned through um, each of the arguments? The next theme uh, that I want to take up is one that was introduced in Durkheim and Freud, the question of suffering and the question of sacrifice, both of which were touched on ever so briefly. Does anyone recall how uh, the question of suffering was introduced with, with Durkheim? Suffering and sacrifice seem to go hand in hand. So you may recall that for Durkheim, that there was a sense in which in his construction of this opposition, I'll do it right here, between um, you know, the, the human, human being being structured by the social, the individual, the human, the animal, etc. That one of the arguments he puts forward in the dualism of human nature is that human beings have to sacrifice their animal side or their biological side, that is, their feeling of living in the world, the ease of that they must sacrifice it and suffer accordingly in order to aspire to a greater civilizational drive to become educated. In other words, there's this sense in which one surrenders one's natural instincts. And this introduces, of course, the theme of, of Freud in Civilization and its Discontents, the surrender or the sublimation of natural biological instincts for shared collective normative conduct to take hold. 
And so for both of those thinkers then, there's this question of sacrificing the natural, sacrificing the biological or the instinctual, so as to facilitate a social drive, a social orientation for collective shared life together. So those themes seem to go hand in hand. But another layer on top of this is the distinction that Derrida attributes to Descartes, the distinction between response and reaction. That is to say that human beings are uh, credited with a capacity to make meaning in meaningful responses to us in opposition to non-human animals who simply react. And this is Descartes' legacy, according to Derrida. And Derrida, in midway through the course, we read his interview with Elizabeth Rudinesco. And in that interview, um, Derrida introduced and helped us to uh, place an analytical distinction between these two ideas in his reading of, of Descartes. And it uh, may be fair to say that Derrida didn't have to do a lot of work to make that <laughs> analytical distinction evident because it was pretty, pretty clear in the text. And the last theme that I, I want us to be mindful of for today is this idea of what it is to have a self. And we haven't really touched on the idea of naming or the importance of the name in, uh, in expressing our selfhood, that I, Melanie, am known to you as Melanie, to distinguish myself from all of you that I have a name and that each of you has a name is kind of one of the practical, certainly, but philosophical conditions for selfhood. And for Descartes, there's a sense in which that I, that capacity to name an I, to name I am, is something that uh, Derrida picks up. And this question about this capacity to, to name and be named is something that ends up becoming an important component of, of his argument. And certainly we can uh, return to Durkheim, where there's some altogether evident, but some subtle uh, emphasis on that relationship between the social and the individual. The name is the means by which uh, in a group, in an aggregate group, we come to distinguish each other as individuals. But the power to name is a significant quality that somebody like Derrida will, will end up picking up. So, how many of you, prior to, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we ended up uh, reading Derrida's uh, interview, how many of you have come across Derrida previously? You might have thought the interview was one thing, okay, uh, you get a handle on this guy, and then suddenly, whoa, there you are in the text. And when I asked you just a few moments ago, how many of you found the, the writing frustrating? There are some of you going, oh, right? This is really, it's one of the... Um, characteristic qualities of Derrida. And I remember when I was a graduate student and I had been introduced to him for the first time. And it was honestly an experience. It was an experience in the sense of, um, and I realized I would put it down to one of these sort of formative moments for myself where I was simultaneously fascinated and irritated. Fascinated because 
on the one hand, as you gloss, there seemed to be so much more in the text that I couldn't really figure out. And I was so frustrated and irritated that I couldn't quite make sense of the meaning. And amongst all of the things that I had to do, I remember this essay must have been 20 pages. And it took me two weeks to read because I was so committed to figuring it out. Did I ever really fully figure it out? Absolutely not. And I still have that feeling of being gripped with the dictionary next to me and trying to figure out and trace what is the relationship between the noun and the verb and the noun and the adjective. It was, you know, so I say all this by way of sympathy. And sympathy in the sense that... um, You know, I hope that you would have read this piece, felt the frustration, irritation, but simultaneously the promise of thinking, okay, there's something more here. There's something that is not quite um, apparent. If that's the case, then then we can go go forward. Um, So Derrida uh, was born in 1930 and and died in 2004. Um, He's a French philosopher and... He was born in French Algeria, and uh, much of his his biographical experience is bound up with being um, uh, inside and outside, in the sense of being born in a French colony, eventually uh, traveling to and studying in France, yet not feeling French, feeling uh, outside feeling not part of a community, not part of the the domain in which he found himself. So, and partly that was a function of his uh, Jewish heritage. Another part of it was just the the conditions of, of intellectual life in France. But this very personal feeling of being included and excluded part of something and then not part of something, was uh, ultimately uh, such a formative experience in shaping his intellectual work. And so he is uh, credited with introducing a particular kind of reading. His training is as a philosopher and um, as a means of contributing to our you know, knowledge, knowledge of the world. But as a philosopher, he's not a philosopher in the manner of someone like Bergson or in the manner of someone like Descartes, who are seeking to find some kind of absolute knowledge, um, who are looking for the conditions of reality or the conditions of what true knowledge might be. Rather, his, his work tends to be confined to particular texts. And so what, he, what tends to characterize his approach is he would take you know, any kind of philosophical text. And let's, uh, for the sake of argument, say you know, the first text would be Meditations on First Philosophy, And this is, of course, the text that we read in week two. So this is uh, Descartes. So he would take that text and introduce a style of reading that attempts to expose some of the fundamental assumptions guiding the text. And you might say to yourself, okay, well, isn't that just philosophy? Isn't that just theory? And it is, um, it certainly, one would say, but it's a very particular uh, series of strategies and techniques. And I think to understand it, um, you know, and, and to understand it, we might use this notion of a deconstruction and contrast it to another formulation just to be able to capture the difference between them. So when one, so let's sort of start with this idea of destruction. We've had philosophers seek to destroy. Who has sought to destroy? 
they, they come, yes. You know, when I was a young boy, I learned these things, and now I found them to be uh, flawed. So now I need to demolish, destroy my opinions upon which then new foundations can be, um, can be developed. And so deconstruction, or pardon me, I should say destruction. Destruction then involves a certain kind of obliteration, a flattening out, getting rid of, right, until there's actually nothing there, and then removing it so that there's a new clean slate upon which something can be built. But deconstruction suggests something different is happening. What do you think? What does the word suggest to you? Okay, so so that's interesting. So there's the, I'll just, um, sorry. So there's the pulling apart of elements of elements. And what was the second part of what you said? To rebuild. So here's my question. Why would it not then be reconstruction? It's in a different way. So rebuild differently. Pardon me? Okay. With implied improvements or we might say awareness of the work that has taken place. Does anyone else want to contribute? If we just get rid of the D for a moment and we think about construction, what does construction suggest? When you construct something, you build, yes. So, so there is a certain part of building of possibly creating, right? Creating or building, but then pulling apart those elements to rebuild differently. Does that make sense? So the idea of deconstruction is essentially that the elements that you've got to work with are always going to be internal to the text. So the elements on which, you know, say, for instance, as Derrida does, he says, okay, I'm going to deconstruct meditations on first philosophy. He doesn't go to Bergson or Durkheim or any other thinkers to say, hmm, what kind of tools can I use to analyze this text over here and then bring those to apply here? Rather, the point of view is always inside the text. That is, that the tools to create or build the text are already implicit and evident, but the pulling apart of those elements, whatever those elements are, will reveal certain kinds of assumptions or oppositions upon which those assumptions are built. So part of the task of deconstruction is, depending on the text, you'd identify in part what kind of opposition one is working with and seek to reveal the assumption driving the text. So it's it's interesting uh, to reflect on Derrida's relationship to deconstruction. Because Derrida says, I don't know why people attribute this to me. This is just kind of what I do. I just read these texts. But I don't do deconstruction. It's not a method. Or it's not a step one, step two, step three. Rather, the challenge is, within whatever text you're going to be looking at, the deconstruction, that is, the method of reading it, will take a completely different form, it will take a completely different shape, precisely because the building blocks are internal to that text. And so it's a means of reading that seeks to work within the confines of that particular text. The text that we are considering today, which contains a number of of Derrida's attempts 
to deconstruct these texts is this last one here. It's the animal that therefore I am. And Derrida gave this, um, it took the form of a lecture. And if you'll see, the lecture was delivered in 1997. And it was not very long until Derrida passed away. And at the time that he um, gave the lecture, he was quite ill already. And it was the case that there was this big, big conference. And everyone was packed in to, uh, in to see him speak. And um, I, I recalled an, a personal event when I was a graduate student reading Derrida for the first time. And Derrida uh, came to uh, speak. And uh, so some friends and I, we, we dr had an all-nighter. We drove down. It was to Cornell University. And we were going to see the great scholar speak. And uh, so we drove all night. We shared turns. Blah, 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 and we arrive. And it was really my first experience with the public kind of persona of a French intellectual. Uh, as we entered the lecture hall, we had um, metal detectors on the doors. There were, um, uh, um, I call them spies, but they were security guards with their walkie-talkies <laughs> and their, their ear pieces like this. Eagle has landed, eagle in the building, or whatever is going on, and um, making sure. And it was just incredibly packed. And so we had got there early so we could see uh, front seat. And this must have been in about, um, you know, uh, uh, before he, he, a couple years before he died. And, um, and so he came up to the front. And what was amazing was that the, introdu the person who introduces them, honestly, the introducer, went on for like 30 minutes, and the great scholar, and the great man, and here we are. <laughs> you know? And so and he just came up, and he started talking. And do I, ever, do I remember anything that he said? No. Um, it was a version of his writing where, uh, you know, one sentence would be uh, put forward in, in seeming fact, but then the next sentence would be undermining it. And um, I couldn't follow it, but it was the whole mystique of being in the presence of, of this great man. So I think this must have been what was going on when Derrida offered the lectures uh, that came to constitute the book, The Animal That Therefore I Am, because he was asked to deliver a two-hour lecture. And so he, he talks and talks and talks, and at the end of two hours, he's about to sit down, which could dramatize it and take the stool. And everyone said, no, no. Speak more. Oh, you can't stop. We're so excited. Like, no. And so then the conference organizer says, oh, you know, Mr. Professor, you know, are you still able to speak more? Oh, yes, I, I still have more in me. Anyway, this went on, and dude talked for something like 10 hours. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my. It's so I know I, you're very kind on week nine to come hear Melanie White lecture, but I probably know that 11 o'clock you're going to be like, rather than, oh, we need to hear more, more from you, Melanie. I don't care about lunch. I don't care about that other cup of coffee. I want to hear more. So... It gives you a sense of, um, I think he did, of course, take a break. And, you know, he had something that wasn't finally prepared. And it was, oh, no, you know, it's not finally prepared. People are, we don't care. We just want you to speak. And so it just gives you the impression of uh, like a, a, a college, if you will, like a collegial community of people, very aware of, a man's, uh, you know, uh, of this man's finitude, that his passing was eminent. And yet this would be one of the last opportunities to hear him speak. And so this text has perhaps a different shape than many of his more formal publications in the sense that it's a written piece, but it's also, um, it's a written piece, but as it was delivered as a lecture, it tends to kind of move all over rather than be focused in, um, in a straight line. So um, for our purposes, what I have done is to extract sort of two dimensions or two focal points that can guide 
our inquiry. And I've divided them into what I'm calling the philosophical problem. That is the problem that Derrida is concerned with in this piece, which is the origin of morality. Where does morality come from? And his interest isn't, isn't in finding the answer to that question, but rather his, his interest is in how do philosophical accounts provide an answer to that question? And what assumptions end up governing their account? And further, of those assumptions, how do those assumptions actually work to undermine the whole logic of the argument in the first instance? So the second problem that he's interested in exploring <laughs> is what I'll call the ethical political problem. And this is the problem of violence and suffering in the text, particularly with respect to the violence and suffering of non-human animals. Because for Derrida, you know, certainly Meditations on First Philosophy, um, you know, published in 1641, you know, Derrida's writing, and it's 1997. So, you know, there's a good, let's say, 200, and I, my math are terrible on the spot, so we'll say 300 years, 300 years in between. And from this point to this point, something rather dramatic has taken place with respect to the industrialization of, of means of um, farming animals and uh, using animals for industrialized purposes, for cosmetics, for uh, health, for medicine, for science, for uh, feeding population, for industry, etc. And Derrida identifies this transition as being fundamental in terms of organizing our moral ethical problem of the moment. So these two are ostensibly perhaps separated, but in practice they're actually um, of animality. And in many ways this is kind of what we've been doing in the course, is to look at the ways in which our conceptions of the self have actually obscured this, that there's something of the notion of the animal that has been latent or implicit within each of these conceptions of self that we've been looking at. And for Derrida, this kind of logic, the logic of a subterranean uh, question of animality, this assumed sense of what the animal is or what it's capable of, is something that underscores so many approaches to knowledge, philosophical approaches to knowledge, philosophical approaches to morality, and to selfhood more generally. So one of the things that he seeks to do, and in this text as our starting point, is to raise the animal, the category of the animal, to a question. That is, to not take it for granted anymore, and to question, what is it? What does it do? What's going on here? And so, as a shorthand, we'll call this the question of animality. That is, to refuse to take for granted this particular category as animating a human conception of selfhood. So if we think about deconstruction and the way that Derrida approaches these particular texts, um, we can return to Derrida's biograph biography and that constitutive, constitutive feeling of being simultaneously inside and outside. What Derrida will call feeling myself and feeling myself as another. 
right? So just uh, yeah. Then there's the sense of dualism. So myself and myself as another, i.e., myself social, perhaps, but myself as another, as individual. Does that make sense? So that Derrida is trying to offer a way of thinking about, okay, so just using Durkheim here, that these two can constitute myself, but there's one element here that tends to be privilege relative to another, depending on whatever thinker we're working with. And so Derrida is kind of interested in this line that distinguishes myself from myself as another. How, at what point, what is the limit here? At what point does it stop where my sociality becomes individual? At what point, coming from the other side, does one's individuality suddenly become overtaken as social? It sort of blurs. There's something indeterminate and uncertain here. And Derrida is interested in this. Now, of course, for our purposes, there is a sense in which Derrida's opposition between myself and myself as another is actually translated in terms of myself as human versus myself as another animal. And yet, funny enough, when we think about these philosophical assumptions, how bizarre and crazy is it that these philosophical systems have been built on this kind of opposition, presuming that uh, being human is not animal. And this is, as we, we saw a couple of weeks ago, this kind of opposition is the one that Derrida is seeking to, seeking to interrogate, to question to raise this category here to a question and to interrogate it. And the idea of his particular style or strategy of reading is to take the author's contribution, identify the dualism that is in play, lay it out, and then determine the extent to which raising the second category to a question, interrogating it, um, understanding what its assumptions are, then this category can be raised to the preferential or hierarchical position. So raised in status. And the reason why it's called deconstruction is because we can't actually eliminate the text. We can't forego the text. If we go back here, and we go back to the definition of deconstruction provided, we pull apart the elements, we identify the assumptions and the oppositions, but we rebuild it differently all the time with the awareness of the fact that the text is built on a certain set of privileges that have been advanced in terms of this opposition between these two dualistic elements. Yes. This was from the vantage of Durkheim. Yeah, that's just an artifact of, of Durkheim. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if you're wanting a more uh, firm, uh, straightforward uh, definition of deconstruction, we might here uh, use this definition. That is to say, it consists in two parts. It's a method of textual engagement that aims to identify, and through this process, denaturalize concepts that form a dualism. So to identify concepts that form a dualism, and then to raise them to a question. That is to challenge the extent to which they are, you know, receive form, a privilege given to the human vis-a-vis -vis the animal. Second. With deconstruction, it's imperative 
that the tools for analysis are not out here, right? Are not outside the text itself. That is, if we're thinking about meditations on first philosophy, we're not looking to Freud or Durkheim to other texts to interrogate that one, but rather the conditions for destabilizing this opposition already exist within the text. And so it is always already there. That is to say that the privilege of upsetting this kind of dualism, pardon, let me repeat that, the capacity to upset this dualism is already evident within the text and can be determined according to a close reading that can challenge some of the assumptions. You might be thinking, okay, this is all really good, Melanie, but why did I spend all this time reading that text? I don't, I sort of got the difference between the animal and the human, and yeah, sure, but how does it work within the text that I read for this course? Well, let's take as a starting point the title of the text. The animal that therefore I am, more to follow. Well, one of the things in this uh, opening is, is very instructive because just as last week when we learned on, it, on um, examination that Bergson was playing around with Descartes and Descartes' language of I think, therefore, I am, or the other version, I am, I exist, so long as I am thinking, I am thinking. You'll recall that last week for Bergson, the question for him was this question of existence. Well. I wouldn't want to put Bergson or Derrida into a contest of who is more playful, um, but I, I think that they're probably uh, fairly evenly matched. Ha ha, that's Melanie's attempt at academic humor, ha ha. Um, because in this, in the title, there is a sense of Derrida's play. Now, I, I, if we just sort of break down the text and we'll, we'll demonstrate it, the sense of an I. I is both, there's an inherent, maybe I won't give it away, there's an inherent dualism within the I. What is the dualism? Descartes, this I, is presumably human, right? What is the opposite? It, the animal, yes. So. If the I has a dualism, one part is human, the other part is the animal, right? The animal, so I think, is ultimately what constitutes one's humanity, right? So we can just accord this here, and this is all brought up within the human, but Derrida, given his interest, and saying, okay, well, you know, philosophy thinks in these dualisms. The human, I think, that's Descartes' answer. And if we flip it and consider what the opposition is, it's the animal, right? The animal who doesn't have the capacity for thinking because this is bound up with the human. So if we're going to make, if we're going to go through the process of identifying an opposition, we can just contrast, I think, which is a human capacity to the animal, right? With me so far? The animal that, therefore, the animal that therefore I am. Hence, we have the name of the title of this, uh, this selection of lectures, that it's the animal that therefore I am, but with more to follow. Now, if you translate this into French, you'd have the animal, uh, 
Donc, je suis, right? The animal that therefore I am. But for those of you French speakers out there, you'll know that the conjugation of I am, je suis, that this is actually fairly deceptive. Because when you read je suis, it can mean I am, or it can mean I follow. So Derrida, playing a funny little uh, game of language, will say, huh, which one is it? Is it that therefore I am? Or is it that therefore I follow? Once you consider the meaning of those two sentences, you get a fundamentally different articulation of what the priority or privilege is accorded to, <laughs> accorded to the text. Once you translate, I think therefore I am, as in the opposition, the animal that therefore I am, okay, so we see Derrida here breaking down that human-animal opposition, but once we go even further, we say the animal that therefore I follow, what does following mean? Okay, well, you know, here's Melanie, and I'm following some sort of animal, right? I'm following that animal. So which one comes first? Huh. This one is in first place, right? Because I'm following, so I am now second. I am no longer in the hierarchical position that I thought I was once I read Descartes' Meditation on First Philosophy. I think, therefore, I am. So here, I am the animal that, therefore, I follow with more to come. So you can imagine all of these people in that audience, in that grand lecture hall, hundreds and hundreds of people having had this moment revealed, their minds going, whoa, is it je suis, I follow? Je suis, I am, tell us more, right? This, they're they're um, wanting more. And so we have Derrida's title here, The Animal That Therefore I Am, More to Follow, and in the French, l'animal que je suis, je suis à suivre. And because this has to do with the way in which these verbs are conjugated, être, to be, which is je suis, I am, or suivre, to follow, je suis, I follow. It could be either of those. How do you decide? And this is Derrida's point, just like the image that I showed you, although many of you didn't buy it because the optical illusion was, was not optical enough, we'll call it. There's a sense of, if you were aware of the illusion, it would be difficult to decide which one was the correct view. And once you have this logic revealed, that how do we know which Je suis, it is, Derrida suggests that we are therefore entering into a domain of undecidability. How can we decide which one it is? And for Derrida, there's something very ethical about not deciding, about resisting the decision, of saying, you know what, once we see this, why do we feel compelled to say, oh well, Der pardon me, oh well, Descartes obviously meant je suis, I am. Okay, maybe he did, but maybe he didn't. If we can read it a different way, doesn't this translate into the condition of possibility for transforming our understanding of the text? What we've done here with playing with the title of this particular text and the title of Descartes' 
fundamental contribution, right? I think, therefore, I am the cogito, which is ultimately organizing a whole uh, system of um, human capacity and privilege in modern philosophy, according to Derrida, that all of this, then, allows us to be able to consider this text in new light. And this gives us an inkling as to what's involved in deconstruction, which is why every sentence of Derrida's text, practically, maybe not every single one, but maybe every second or third one, contains a little play that native French speakers might be attentive to and think, oh, he, does he mean this? Oh, no, he could mean that. Which one is it? And that perpetual feeling of uncertainty for Derrida is an ethical response to the injunction to constantly decide. And it provides with us with a space of being able to step back and perform an ethical, um, an ethical act by simply raising texts, categories, concepts like the I here, like the animal here, to a question. So, he'll say, what is this I? This I here, which we assume is human. And you can see this play manifested repeatedly in the text. He'll say, to say I am, right? Je suis, is to say I am following. Now that you have a sense of the, of the uh, joyful kind of move here, he's trying to elaborate in that first bullet point the sense of uncertainty, because we don't know which one it is. To follow, to follow here, and be after will not only be the question and the question of what we call the animal. So once we are aware of this idea of the capacity for je suis to reflect a following or to be after, it therefore, as a consequence, raises what it what is this here? The animal. According to Descartes, something akin to an automaton, something akin to a robot. Now, this reconfigures the place or the hierarchy in, in the structure of the text. I am the third bullet point. And it continues, I am in as much as I am after the animal, so après, or I am in as much as I am alongside après, the animal. And so, again, in the, um, in the French, he's playing with the vocalization of these words. When they're spoken, what is the difference between après and après? You can barely hear the distinction. Is it to walk beside one another, you know? Or is it to walk at a distance? Being after, being alongside, being near, i.e. près, would appear as different modes of being, indeed of being with the animal. But of course, throughout all of this, in the sense of I am, is the I am reflecting the human I am, or is it reflecting the animal that I am? In all of these different ways, the verbs and the adverbs, you know, before, after, etc., give us a sense of the complexity and uncertainty of how we're understanding the relationship between human and animal. Is it a hierarchical one? Is it a uh, different 
simply a different uh, positionality on being near, being far, being close? Is it on the same plane, etc.? And again, Derrida's not asking us to say, ah, obviously the human is inferior to the animal. Obviously. He's not doing that. He's doing something that is just to say, how can we be sure? It's just, he's operating like a good legal courtroom drama, right? Is there a shadow of a doubt? And if there's a shadow of a doubt, well, case closed, right? We cannot be sure. So the perpetrator uh, goes off, right? No charges laid, etc. Okay. So I think, shall we take a break? This is what I'm thinking. Shall we? Yes, let's do it. We will come back and I will introduce you to Logos, who is Derrida's cat. Isn't that marvelous? And this is this great man in his Parisian garden place with his lovely cat sitting on his lap. And we'll come back and talk about this photo. And we'll be back in about five minutes, please. Let's begin again. So just before you left for the break, I showed you this picture of Derrida here um, uh, uh, playing with his cat. And actually, in fact, playing doesn't seem to be the appropriate verb um, because the cat is sitting there and there is no real fondness of, you know, a little scratch behind the ears or a little tickle on the tummy, but it's just kind of, the cat's on me again. <laughs> so I quite like this, um, this photo. Um, and it's also, of course, the cat, um, the cat's name. Uh, Derrida named the cat Logos, i.e. logic. And I think nothing would be more fitting for a Siamese cat than, than that. Um, the text opens with the following phrase. What animal and it's the response is the other, right? And it's almost as if in Derrida's mind's eye, he's thinking about the animal that therefore I am, the title of the piece that, as we showed just before the break, is an homage to Descartes' I think therefore I am. But the question, the animal, what is it? Oh, the other. But is the other me, the animal? Or is it the other other, the animal animal, i.e. the non-human animal? Derrida pauses and lets his audience work through that one. And he says, I, I often ask myself just to see who I am. And who I am who je suis, following at the moment when caught naked in silence by the gaze of an animal, for example, the eyes of a cat, I have trouble, yes, a bad time overcoming my embarrassment. Whence this malaise? Now, if this is not a scintillating opening for an academic piece of work, you know, this is not necessarily as scintillating as they come, but dude's in the shower, he's getting out of the shower, and he's toweling himself off, and lo and behold, there's the cat sitting there. And the cat skates, arrests. I don't know if you've ever had the experience, not necessarily being uh, naked, coming out of a shower, but of a moment where, and there's something interesting about it being a cat, where the cat catches you, and there seems something otherworldly, or something about the animal that, in question, that seems to look deep inside you. Have you ever had a moment like that? Yes. There's something uh, unintelligible, almost. And... It could be any other occasion where Derrida's toweling off, the cat's sitting there, maybe this is part of their routine. Who knows? But it's this moment 
This moment where he catches the eye of the cat and he pauses and feels something disturbed. Not that the cat is disturbing, but that sense of self, of who he is, is adjusted. That suddenly, in this moment, he has a trouble repressing a a reflex dictated by a modesty. So dude's coming out of the shower, and he's like, oh, the cat's looking. (gasps) And he pauses, isn't that strange? It's just a cat. Why do I feel this impulse to cover myself? He has here trouble keeping silent within me, a protest against the indecency of having someone witness one's nakedness, against the impropriety that comes of finding oneself naked, one's sex exposed, stark naked before a cat that looks at you without moving, just to see. So the cat's sitting there looking, and it's like, oh, this feels uncomfortable. I'm going to cover myself. Why is that ostensibly strange and worthy enough to start an opening to to this particular piece of work? Is it an odd thing to want to cover oneself? If, or, you know, in front of an out, yeah? Sure, okay. Okay, so is that an unusual thing? Doesn't he go on to say that it's just strange that he feels embarrassed because like a cat has no concept of like what naked is because like they don't wear clothes, so like mm-hmm. that is like nothing. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, I think I'm I'm posing it in a more general general sense. I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, this is part of Derrida's argument. But you know, is it the case that notionally we feel uh, comfortable exposing ourselves to non-human animals, or is it something that we feel com- uh, comfortable with? Because it, it, I'm just trying to get at the nature of this hook. Like, because if we buy into the hook, then the rest of the argument unfolds, and the hook is, yeah, this is an odd moment, because typically, one, you know, would feel quite fine. There isn't the feeling of indecency, or immodesty, or immorality. Does anyone else want to? It's the week nine doldrums, I can tell. Okay, well, let me tell you. Generally, I mean, so I can tell you what what is going on in Derrida's argument is Derrida is opening up the question of morality. And morality is, of course, conditioned by that sense of a feeling of immodesty when confronted with another who is not your intimate, your spouse, you know, somebody with whom you would feel comfortable exposing yourself, that in this moment there is the suggestion of a possibility of a moral relationship with a non-human animal, this cat, Derrida's cat, who has a name given to it by Derrida called Logos, right? So Derrida is having this encounter of a moment of feeling shock and this impulse to cover. And why is that significant? It's significant in part because it it presumes the possibility of a moral relationship, and yet it is unclear where this impulse is coming from. He continues on the second line, and he says, it is as if I were ashamed, therefore, naked in front of this cat, but also ashamed for feeling, for being, pardon me, ashamed. A reflected shame, the mirror of a shame, ashamed of itself. Right? So on the one hand, we've got, we've got Cat and Derrida. Let's just, and he's got some nice white hair. And so, it is as if I were ashamed therefore naked in front 
of this cat. But also, so it's the regard is going this way, but it's also going internal to himself. The shame toward the other and also the shame of feeling ashamed. So there's these simultaneous things happening. A reflected shame, this here, is a mirror of shame, shamed of itself, a shame that is at the same time specular, unjustifiable, and unable to be admitted to. At the optical center of this reflection would appear this thing, and in my eyes the focus of this incomparable experience that is called nudity. <laughs> and about which it is believed that it is proper to man. That nudity is an attribute of the human, just as reason, sociality, morality might be in terms of each of the thinkers that we've been looking at, and about which it is believed that it is proper to man, that is to say, foreign to animals, naked as they are, naked as they are, or so it is thought, without the slightest inkling of being so. So, here, there is a difference between nudity and naked. What is the difference? Because Derrida is positing that there is a difference. Okay, so naked is the internal vulnerability, and well, it's interesting. Is this undecidable? It's uncertain, right? Hmm, I'm not sure I can decide. Yeah, so the human is aspect of this rather than the animal. Yeah, so vulnerable. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. It's, okay, so, so it's the wearing clothes, right? Still yeah. committed to that? Okay, so naked. So, and naked is no clothes. Anyone else want to? Thank you. Does anyone else want to contribute? So this is cultural. Yes. I mean, this is absolutely true in the context of, um, you know, Derrida's own sort of examination of a Judeo-Christian morality in which all of these thinkers are, are located. So, so yes. To that, yes. Any other observation? I must make it, I know, it's sort of funny. This is sort of one of those arresting moments of the cat. I must make it clear from the start that the cat I'm talking about is a real cat. Truly, believe me, a little cat. But I must also accentuate the fact that this shame that is ashamed of itself is more intense when I am not alone with the cat in the room. For then I am no longer sure before whom I am so numbed with shame. In fact, is one ever alone with a cat or with anyone at all? Is this cat a third person or another in a face-to-face -face duel? In other words, there is this, this sense of what is this figure of the cat representing? Is it a mirror of self? Is it a mirror of myself or myself as another? That is to say, as reflected in this image of a non-human animal. So Derrida is pressing this question of shame. This question of shame associated with this being nude and feeling a certain kind of nakedness that he's seeking in the course of this text to interrogate where these feelings are coming from. Why am I feeling ashamed, he says. Ashamed of what and naked before whom? Here I am coming out of the shower. The cat looks at me and it arrests me. I feel ashamed, and then ashamed of being ashamed. I'm ashamed, he says in this quotation, of being naked as an animal. It is generally thought, although none of the philosophers I'm about to examine actually mention it, that the property unique to animals and what in their final analysis distinguishes them from man is their being naked without knowing it. 
What does it mean? I mean, this is something that you touched on earlier. What does it mean to be naked without knowing it? So it's just natural that, okay. Because he's making a distinction between naked, being naked and nude. So if the naked is, I mean, both of them are no clothes, right? Okay. But one is conditioned by a certain kind of moral relationship, and the other is reflecting the experience of animality. Okay, so that to be naked, yes. So I suppose, you know, cats have fur, but then there are a whole series of other animals who may not have fur. Um, birds who have feathers, I mean, this may be a similar thing, that it reflects a certain kind of instinct. But I'm curious about this idea of naked without knowing it, because there's a sense of a certain kind of knowledge claim that's being made here. To be, if we flip it, what is it to be naked and knowing it? Yes. So here, so there's a lack of self-awareness. We're getting somewhere. Okay. Naked and knowing it. I had, well, yeah, okay, so we can just start taking off our clothes and we'll know it. How will we know it? Because everybody's going to feel really uncomfortable, right? There's going to be a moral discomfort which would presumably distinguish us from non-human animals. They are naked without knowing it. They're not wearing clothes, unless you have these, these little Pomeranians with, or, and you're one of those people who put little golf outfits on it or whatever, right? Um, unless you're, you're in that camp. But naked without knowing it versus being naked and knowing it. That distinction prompts a different moral relationship to the wearing of clothes and to the wearing of clothes, with, which signals and situates you within a whole series of emotional relations, emotional relations of, of shame, anxiety, discomfort, etc. And Derrida is interested in situating this discussion within this context of where is this distinction between being nude and being naked, of knowing it or not knowing it, where does that come from? And so Joanne said, well, Melanie, of course this is this, you know, Western tradition. And Derrida is, yeah, this is a Western tradition where not being naked, therefore, is, and I'm just picking up the quotation here, not being naked, therefore, not having knowledge of their nudity, in short, without consciousness of good and evil. So if we go to the Western Judeo-Christian tradition, where there is a moment of knowing nudity, of having a consciousness of good and evil, where would we go? Dun, dun, dun! Where would we go? What is the, the lore? of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Where do we find the moment of discovery? Oh, oh dear, I'm having, I think, this is, where would you go? What text? Yeah, we'd be going to the Bible. Absolutely, thank you so much. You are lovely. Absolutely. Okay, we've tackled naked or nude. It's like, wow, this is, you know what, I'm, this is week nine. Okay, and it's note to self, week nine, and not just week nine, but Derrida in week nine. So those two, that's, that's the challenge. Okay, naked or nude, we've kind of discussed this. We're just moving along, and we're coming to the Bible. We come to Genesis, the Jewish Bible, and in Genesis, the Bible opens up, and there is this selection where woman was made from Adam's rib, and they lived together with all of the animals in the Garden of Eden, and lo and behold, there was this beautiful tree. And in this beautiful tree, God said to, to Eve, the woman, do, 
and to, to Adam, never eat from this, the fruit from this tree. It is the tree of knowledge. And so they abided until a nasty serpent came along and whispered in Eve's ear, oh, that fruit, that apple on the tree of knowledge is so delicious, you really want to try it. And the woman, oh, no, 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 I can't. Oh, yes. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And she gave also unto her husband with her that temptress, Eve that temptress, said, here, take some of this apple, you will be wise. And he did eat. And the moment they eat the flesh of the apple, the eyes of them were both opened. They went from being naked. Wow, that was a nice underscore. They went from being naked without knowing it to naked and suddenly knowing it. The eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <laughs> somehow to cover their private parts, you know, not to cover their knees or their elbows. Um, I always think that's, yeah, anyway, never mind. They covered their private parts. And so we have then this distinction, naked without clothes, exposed to harm, perhaps vulnerable, but nude, wearing no clothes or pinkish or beige in color, right? There is a sense in which a nudity that is conditioned by a decision, perhaps, to remove clothes or put them on, takes on this language. But being cast from the Garden of Eden is a relic of that old narrative, that old tale of Adam and Eve eating from the fruit um, eating the apple from the tree of knowledge, and therefore being wise, given wisdom, i.e., hey, folks, you're naked now. You have to cover up with a fig leaf and an apron. Now, Derrida says, from that point on, naked without knowing it, animals would not be in truth, be naked. Why? Why is it only Adam and Eve, who are naked and knowing it. Why is it the case that animals, in truth, would not be naked? They need to know that they're naked, and they're ultimately not. And so for Derrida, what is the hinge here is this relationship between morality and knowledge. And we come back, if we go to this uh, first board, or did I, I have you, silly, I have erased everything, but it will be embedded in your memory nonetheless. I am, I exist so long as I am thinking. I think, therefore, I am. I am is essentially conditioned by thinking, but I am is also essentially conditioned by nakedness, because it is that knowledge that is acquired through this moment of eating the apple. And so animals have no awareness, no knowledge, no conscious of being naked. And so in truth, they are not naked. Derrida here, here's his little towel. Derrida is naked and knowing it. They wouldn't be naked because they are naked. Right? This, is, this is the moment of the uh, mental, um, mental play that uh, Derrida is introducing us to. Animals are not naked because they are naked. Humans are naked because they are not naked. 
they're simultaneously both. And what Derrida is doing is working through the logic of these sentences, keeping in our mind's eye the assumption that governed the first utterance and then switching the terms of it. Because it is naked without existing in nakedness. The animal neither feels nor sees itself naked. What is this difference? And here we have this emphasis again on this question of exist, which organized Bergson's efforts last week. And we find it manifesting again, and again in an homage to Descartes. What is the difference between it is and existing? Bergson gave us a bit of an insight just to what does it mean to exist? Yeah. Yes. Hell, yes, I know we're talking about the Judeo-Christian Bible, and I will say hallelujah. Yes, that is correct. The distinction is between is, that sort of firm, fixed, it is something, versus existing, which is becoming, right? Because it is, right? It is naked. It expresses that fixity without existing in nakedness. That sense of becoming in nakedness, which is an expression or a manifestation of that human awareness, the knowledge of being naked. And this is why non-human animals are naked without knowing it, and human beings are naked in knowing. So the third quotation here, because it is naked without existing in nakedness, the animal neither feels nor sees itself naked, and it therefore is not naked. It's not naked in the same way that the human is naked, because the human, of course, is naked in knowing it and needs to have this nice little Pierre Cardin towel to cover up the private parts, not needing the leaves and the apron. For man, it would be the opposite. Man would be the only one to have invented a garment to cover his sex. He would be a man only to the extent that he was able to be naked. That is to say, to be ashamed. To know, to know himself, to be ashamed because he is no longer naked. And knowing himself would mean knowing himself to be ashamed. So it's back to your point earlier which is that conscious awareness of knowing oneself, je suis, I am, I think, therefore I am, I know myself, I am, I exist, and knowing himself would mean knowing himself to be ashamed. What does this mean for morality, for one of the fundamental attributes the properties of the human. Well, the animal does not have morality because, according to Derrida, modesty would remain as foreign to it as would immodesty. Now, this isn't Derrida's argument, but it's an argument that is derived from his deconstruction of uh, Descartes' text, right? It's not that. Uh, Derrida is advancing this view, i.e., humans are, uh, have morality and animals do not, but this is the implication stemming from the text. But the second point here is that the knowledge of self that is bound up with the experience of modesty and morality would also be foreign to the animal as well. Derrida says, okay, let us return and reconsider this understanding. Let us return back to Genesis, to the first book of the Bible, and consider this moment, this moral failing, where Eve takes a bite of the apple and gives the apple to Adam. Derrida points out, isn't it a fascinating thing that it's this moral failing this moral fault 
of Eve that ends up conditioning a moment of being moral in the world, of being naked and knowing it. And isn't it fascinating that according to this narrative story, that the origin of morality is actually determined by virtue of having, to, having committed a moral sin. That because of a fault, a fault committed by humans, man conceives animals as being absolutely innocent prior to good and evil without fault or defect. Isn't it fascinating then that by virtue of this moral transgression conducted by human beings, that the process, and it's a, it's a very strange inversion, that the process of committing this moral transgression then gives to animals a sense of innocence, of purity, of being naked and not knowing it, therefore not altogether naked, and yet this moral fault is what gives human beings a morality and the capacity of existing in nakedness and knowing of their nakedness. What is proper to man? What is the characteristic of being human, in other words? His superiority over and subjugation of the animal, the very fact of being superior to the animal, of being in this hierarchy, this dualism that privileges the human over the non-human animal, his very becoming subject, his historicity, his emergence out of nature, all of these characteristics that characterize the human as the capital H, his sociality, his access to knowledge and techniques, all that, everything, in a non-finite number of predicates, everything that is proper to man would derive from this originary fault, this originary moral failing of taking the apple from the tree. This movement actually then conditions humanity, its privilege, because it now knows nakedness. Indeed, from this defect in propriety, what is proper to man as a defect in propriety. Do you see that deconstruction? He's just sort of identified a moral failing as being the condition for moral conduct. What is shame if one can be modest only by remaining immodest and vice versa? Man could never become naked again because he has the sense of nakedness that is to say, of modesty or shame. The animal would be in this naked equals really non-nudity because it has no awareness of that nakedness, that is to say, of modesty or shame. The animal would be in non-nudity because it is nude. And man in nudity to the extent that he is no longer nude. Therefore, we encounter a difference, a time or a contretemps between two nudities without nudity. In other words, here is this really indeterminate moment after feeling a profound and fundamental confusion. So who's naked, who's not? Who's nude, who's not? Is there a nudity anymore? Is there a non-nudity? Is there morality? Is there non-morality? What is it? What, how can we decide? This here, everything seems to be blurry and confused. And if you're feeling that it's blurry and confused, because all Derrida seems to be saying is he's naked, it's not naked, it's naked, it's not naked. And Melanie seems to be repeating the same line, seeming to know as if she knows what he's saying. Nudity to non-nudity, in nudity, in, blah, blah, blah. If you're feeling confused and uncertain and you can't decide whether the animal is naked or not naked or nude or non-nude or the human being is naked or not naked, then Derrida's point will have been achieved. 
the assumption, of course, is that this is the logic unfolding of this reading, of this process of deconstructing these elements in the text by working closely with the text and twisting the meaning and our understanding of it to reveal an uncertainty. And if that uncertainty is there, and you recognize that uncertainty, then Derrida's job has been accomplished. There's the dick. Right? In the end, coming to an almost seeming equivalence that we can't decide which is nude, which is non-nude, because the conditions of possibility for both are so different, and yet the net result is indeterminate. So, it's at this point that he returns to the myth of the, uh, to the gaze of the cat, and he's sitting there, coming out of the shower, and he's like, okay, cat, I'm thinking you cat, Fluffy the cat, you're like the serpent in this story, right? I'm thinking that you are the serpent whispering in Eve's ear, take from the tree of knowledge. And so he's making this analogy to say that the cat's gaze in its arresting quality prompts that knowledge, just as the serpent whispers in Eve's ear and prompts her to take of the fruit to therefore know that she is not naked or know that she is naked, sorry. The animal brings man to a consciousness of his nakedness and of good and evil, rather than being the cause of his fall. And so this is Derrida's attempt to deconstruct the familiar logic of the way in which it is the serpent, that devil, who is the one to be blamed for coercing or convincing Eve to eat from the fruit, right? This is a familiar narrative. Rather, Derrida is saying, ah, simply by uh, substituting the cat for the serpent, we can present an altogether different narrative that that gaze, that arresting quality, the quality of the animal who is naked but without knowing it can prompt us, human, to an awareness of our own nakedness and an awareness of our experience of shame. And so this is where, you know, this piece of this is that I've been attempting to draw on, on the board. This is where he says, okay, this discussion offers to my sight the abyssal limit of the human. That is, at what point do we decide what is human or not human? What is the limit of the human? We can't decide. This is for him the abyssal limit. The undecidable equals the abyssal limit or the undecidable equals a rupture. It's completely open offers to my sight the abyssal limit of the human, the inhuman or the ahuman, the ends of man, that is to say the border crossing from which vantage man dares to announce himself to himself, thereby calling himself by the name that he believes he gives himself. One of the qualities of the Genesis story is that Adam significantly names the animals. It is Adam who who names the animals and, in so doing, gives a power to, uh, assumes a power to be able to accord a name. 